My name is Alex White. I'm Director General here at the Institute. Everybody is very welcome. This will be a most interesting and stimulating uh, session, I know. Uh, welcome to our speakers. Welcome to you all. And it's my pleasure to hand over to my colleague, Dan O'Brien, to uh, chair the event this afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so I won't repeat the introductions, but a particular thanks to our uh, visitors who are here with us uh, from Finland, who has come all the way, and our uh, visitors, uh, our speakers online uh, in the UK and France. Subject of today's uh, discussion is horizon scanning for enterprise growth. Um, over the past 10 years or so, um, or over my entire life, it was often, often something said that uh, the pace of change is accelerating. Um, I never thought that was true until recent times. So many things are happening now. The world is extremely difficult to predict things that nobody would have ever thought uh, would have happened, have happened over the past seven, eight years or so. So I think it's particularly interesting to have a discussion like this uh, today. Let me just introduce each, each speaker uh, before going to our first speaker. Uh, Aaron Maniam is the Fellow of Practice and Director of Digital Transformation Education at the Blatnevik Institute. Uh, Larry O'Connell is Director of the National Economic and Social Council here in Ireland. Alessandra Kolekia is Head of Science and Technology Policy uh, at the OECD. And Soila Olila is the Foresight Manager at Business Finland. So if our uh, speaker, uh, Aaron, is ready to go. We'll ask you to maybe give introduction, introductory remarks for about five minutes. Uh, and we would ask all the speakers to keep it to five minutes. So we have plenty of time to, for discussion. Uh, and I think there will be plenty of discussion. So uh, please, over to you, Aaron, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so very much for that really kind introduction and the invitation to join you today. It's a real pleasure. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Um, I had the pleasure of setting up a Center for Strategic Futures in the Singaporean government, where I served as a policymaker for several years before I joined the Blavatnik School at Oxford. And a lot of what I talk about today will draw from those experiences, as well as a broad comparison that I'm increasingly studying uh, across different countries of how their systems of foresight operate. And the organizers asked me to address three things in the five minutes that I have. Uh, why is foresight necessary? How is it being used? And who's doing it well? Right, so let me take each of those three questions in turn. First of all, on why foresight is necessary, there are any number of reasons um, around how complex the world is becoming. Right? There's new acronyms like VUCA and TUNA and RUT and us living in a Bani world. Uh, we can go through the details of that if people are interested, but these are eminently Googleable. So I, I won't go through those details in, in my remarks. But suffice to say that this perception of increasing unpredictability, complexity, and turbulence is prompting, I think, a much greater focus on good foresight. But if we think about it, I suspect the world has always seemed a little bit unmanageable and turbulent to anyone who's living in any time, right? So we mustn't fall guilty of the trap of chronocentricity and assuming that our time is somehow more, um, more difficult than any other time. So I think part of this is really that what we are finding is that the world we live in now is increasingly difficult to manage because it is making us question our assumptions, right? It's forcing us to grapple with things that we don't like, with unpredictabilities that expose the fact that the things we assume to be true about the world, our mental models and our deep, um, deeply held biases are proving to be untrue. And good foresight, therefore, addresses those things, right? which leads me to, to the second question on how it's being used. I think it's really important to remember that foresight, when, when used in any government or any organization, is never used for predictive purposes. We may think it's about predicting the future, but what we are really doing is doing three R's, right? We are reperceiving the present. We're reperceiving and questioning the assumptions that we might have, asking ourselves where those need to be updated, refined, if you're a statistician, this is what people often call updating your priors. But it's really about saying the deeply held views that we have may need to be refined and updated. Secondly, apart from reperceiving, we then need to rehearse what we might do if certain things happen. And the future is often much more complex than we think it might be. But can we rehearse the di different options and opportunities that are out there so that when something happens, we can at least adjust those initial plans that we might have made? And the third R, apart from reperceiving and rehearsing, is that it, Foresight is being used to build resilience, right? It's building resilience in the sense of preparing for how and where we might respond to particular crises or particular circumstances, even if they vary slightly from the experiences that we might have had. A new pandemic may not be exactly like COVID, but it might be similar and it might be something we can therefore use 
some of the muscles that we built up during pande the pandemic preparation to actually respond to new crises. This then leads to the issue of who's doing this work well. Right. And, and there's a range of examples here that we could draw on. And what I wanted to do was highlight four different ways of organizing a foresight ecosystem. There's the ways of organizing it through entirely through a civil service, right, in, in a public sector. Singapore, my own country, does that well. The UK has a policy lab that includes a foresight function. Canada has policies in Canada, all of which within the civil service have institutionalized a structure through which foresight feeds into decision making. But it's also possible to organize this around parliamentary models, right? The Estonians, for instance, have an act of parliament called the Foresight Act, which has established a foresight center within their parliament as an advisory body. The New Zealand and Australian system is really interesting because it builds an interface within the civil, between the civil service and parliament, right? Where it has mandated by law the production of long-term insights briefings or LTIBs that need to be presented by each agency to parliament. And I think once you structure it in this way, you force the, the fact that the long term has to feature in, in this sort of work. Uh, the Welsh also have the, the Future Generations Act, which again structures and institutionalizes the fact that foresight needs to be a priority. And then finally, you have Finland and the Netherlands. And I won't say too much about Finland because we have a Finnish expert on our panel. But what I admire about the Finnish system is that it is an ecosystem, right? It, there is the Prime Minister's office, there is the Parliament with its foresight committee or committee on the future, and wonderful entities like Business Finland and Citra, which are also bringing foresight into a broader multi-stakeholder ecology. And that can work really well too, right? So I thought it was useful to mention that all these examples have proven to be successful in their own ways by organizing and harnessing different parts of the, the overall system. I've got about five seconds left, so I'll hand back to you uh, in, in, in Ireland now, and I'll look forward very much to the question and answer session. Aaron, thank you very much. That was really concise and information-packed uh, contribution. I'd like to just follow up on the issue of bias. Um, and I think this can be a particular problem in smaller countries <laughs> that can be prone to groupthink. Is, is there a way you can, you can counteract sort of bias and groupthink? Well, one hopes there can be a silver bullet on this kind of thing, right? But unfortunately, I don't think there is. I think the ways in which we counteract bias and groupthink are by building a culture where we are constantly questioning the deep assumptions that we might have. And part of that involves talking to people who might make us uncomfortable. It means sitting down for lunch with them as individuals. And it, as countries, it means having you know, international advisory panels or networks that we tap into, where we know that people will, in a hopefully friendly and constructive way, challenge the, the assumptions that we might have. It comes from setting up external advisory panels. It comes from setting up councils where you can tap into international uh, and, and non-government uh, expertise. But those sorts of structures, I think, are the best ways to ensure that the questioning of bias becomes something that we structure into our systems. That's great. Thank you. Um, Larry, can I give the floor to you? Thank you very much, Dan. And thanks very much uh, to the IIEA for the invite today. It's, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, just briefly to say, so for us, and I work in NESC, which is the National Economic and Social Council, and it provides a, advice to, to government. And our remit is to, to try to focus on the medium to long term. So that's what we try to, to do all of the time in, in the work uh, that we do. Um, but I just wanted to just own up to something else that I was involved in and maybe gives you some sort of flavor of, of my position on foresight. In, in about 2006, 2007, I was involved in a project called Futures Ireland. And it was a very, very big foresight exercise in Ireland, which aimed to look at across economic, social, environmental development, where we were going in trends and, 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 and how we could see into the future, maybe that little bit better. It involved working with a lot of experts uh, from around the world, and we did scenario planning, all sorts of things. And it, it was very interesting for me, and I have to own up to this, that we were doing that project as the Irish economy fell off a cliff, and nobody in the project saw that coming. So in one sense, my personal reflection was that as we scanned the horizon, we fell over our shoelaces. So I always think very deeply about as, we, as you do foresight, you, you really need to keep attention to what's going on around you. So that's where my bias, where I come to this conversation. The real saving grace in that project was we worked with about 180 people who were, we deemed to be innovators across business, the arts, uh, the civil service, et cetera, people we identified as being you know, groundbreaking in their, in their own fields. And as that I suppose, scenario evolved where we saw the economy crashing. We went back to them and said, we're, we, we've missed this. What happened? And really, the conversation we started to have with them was in their daily lives, they were doing less scanning the horizon and more really deeply monitoring what was happening going on around them. So they, 
we, we summarized it as being what they were obsessed with was gathering data about what was happening, reviewing it in real time, and very quickly revising where they needed to be. So that seemed to be the core agility that they had evolved, particularly, as I say, entrepreneurs. So now looking at 2024, I think it's really interesting. We, we, I think absolutely the way you've described it, that sense of the, the, the policy system being under enormous pressure, huge levels of uncertainty. A, a caveat I would say, Dunnock and Cavan is in the, in the audience. Dunnock has done a paper which shows that maybe there's less uncertainty at the moment than there was in previous. So we can come back to that, but it's an interesting angle. But undoubtedly there's huge levels of uncertainty. There's huge pressure to deliver immediate in, in, implementation is the core issue that we're, we're focusing on. And there's an enormous sense that some of the issues are, there's a very singular focus, that people coming to a particular agenda are focused on one and not the whole, which is fair enough for most people. So what I look at it then is a sense of, well, we undoubtedly, in that cauldron, that firefighting, we need more space to be able to be more reflective and think. But as I say, I think it needs to remain connected to the day-to-day. -day. I think in an Irish context, the good news is that, that a lot of the pieces are in place. And uh, at lunch, we were hearing and reminded, and it's really important, Technology Foresight was one of the big successful foresight projects that was, was carried out, not, not just here, it's seen as an example elsewhere, and it produced Science Foundation Ireland. That's a really, really important touchstone for us. But around the system, we've got national risk assessment, we've got now we have a well-being framework, we're looking at future capitals in that. We've got work within the uh, public expenditure reform on public sector transformation. It's really trying to work with the OECD and others to think about foresight. We have individual foresight sectoral work in Chagas, in Department of Further Education on AI. So there's lots of happening. We've even talked in Ireland, it, it's been remoted about the idea of having a future generation commissioner. That's it, it been suggested from the political parties. So we're having conversations about these issues. But for me, there still is a sense that there's something missing in that picture. I think there's a couple of things that are missing. For me, one of them is tools. We, I mean, I think we need to be always open to, are there better tools out there to do foresight in a different way, new platforms, new techniques? And again, from the conversation at lunch, I think they're there and they're going to come up in today's conversation. The other thing that's missing is, I think we have to be really honest and say that the nature of the foresight work means that what you're bringing back to the system is a weak signal about what you should do. So then you have to look at, has the system or the organization or the company or whoever, has it got the capacity to take the risk to respond to what is a weak signal about what it should do? How does it choose from the various scenarios and foresights? And it, we cannot, none of the tools will provide certainty in that. We, it, it requires leadership. It requires systems that allow people to take some risks and how we deal with that. And I think we, in our futures work in, in, in 2007, that was the big conclusion we came to. Do we have systems that are capable of creating enough autonomy to allow people to take risks? So I, I guess that's for me where I think that, that foresight fits in the system. And maybe I'll stop at that point, Dan. Right, yeah, the, the point about uh, tripping over your shoelaces as you look at the horizon is a, a very quotable uh, comment. Uh, good, uh, can we go to Paris and Alessandra, if you're ready to join us? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, bonjour uh, from Paris. So um, I'm from Science Technology Innovation. I must say at the OECD, as many of you know, we also have a small but impact impactful strategic foresight unit that provides studies, tools, and support for other OECD directorates uh, via a dedicated foresight toolkit. But I am not a foresight expert uh, myself. Uh, but I would talk more broadly about strategic intelligence, so foresight and horizon scanning are part of it, uh, going back to what Larry said about tools. So a set of tools that help, help policymakers to anticipate and guide transformation. So uh, it's not just horizon scanning or foresight, uh, it's uh, technology assessment, uh, advanced data analytics, for example. So I have two keywords here, anticipation and strategic intelligence. So what we did the, earlier this year, we gathered ministers from science technology of OECD countries and beyond. And they launched, among other things, an anticipatory uh, governance framework for emerging technologies. So this framework really emphasizes shared values, anticipation, societal engagement, agile governance, and international cooperation. So one of the pillars of this framework is strategic intelligence. This is something that informs the development of strategic visions, plans, and roadmaps for emerging technologies. 
So basically, we need to combine different sorts of strategic intelligence for policymaking in this area. So to be both lean and adaptive, uh, I, we uh, support a kind of three steps approach. So first thing, by finding and exploring weak signals, so horizon scanning can locate areas of technological interest, find key drivers of technological technological change, suggest how they may create new opportunities and threats. And in this first and ongoing stage assessment, horizon scanning encompasses a 360 degrees exploration of early stage technology domains. Uh, but once this area of interest has been identified, our next step is really to see whether deeper analysis is needed to take policy action and what forms of strategic intelligence are required. So not all emerging technologies requires new or additional forms of governance or new strategic intelligence. So we need to do a kind of preliminary diagnosis to evaluate if a technology is of greater or lesser concern. So once you've done that, so the third steps we, we talk about is to uh, really uh, deep dive with deep dive analysis of technology, provide a richer evidence base, selecting appropriate tools. So if horizon scanning helps scan for weak signals, foresight can help stress test policy options, technology assessment can help unpack values, explore future impacts of technologies, and advanced analytics is the basis for uh, the evidence for all these options. So each tool plays a different role, and each is useful at the different stage in the policy cycle. And then I was asked by the organizers to give some examples of what we are doing at the OECD in terms of strategic intelligence around new and emerging techs. So currently our team is examining the evolution and implication of synthetic biology. This is an amazing field. It helps treating infectious and genetic diseases. It can help preventing food shortages, mitigate the impacts of climate change, but at the same time, there are inherent risks accompanying this field, center on dual use research and deliberate misuse. So we are, we are working on synthetic biology, the convergence of synthetic biology with AI. And next year, we'll carry out the technology assessment of quantum technologies. And at the OECD, we also have a dedicated team working on artificial intelligence. There is an AI futures group that's been running for almost a year, discussing various aspects of AI emergence. And, and Aaron, uh, the first speaker in this panel, is part of that group, so I'm sure he can distill some learning from that activity. And then just to end, uh, another uh, exercise we're doing applied to a sector is uh, the Foresight Project on the Ocean Economy to 2050. So we're looking at, with the experts, uh, what forces will shape the ocean economy in 2030, 30, 40, 50, developing estimates and projecting them forward using different scenarios. And at the end of the process, we, we aim at providing new evidence-based options for actions on how sustainable management of the ocean economy might be strengthened. So we have many examples, both applied to technology sectors uh, at the OECD. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. Very, very interesting. I look forward to talking further during the Q&A. Um, and over to you, last but not least, Soleil. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. First time in Ireland. Uh, so my op approach is uh, with working with the companies and foresight. But first, I need to tell you a story about our foresight exercises. Uh, referring to the that we need to pay attention to what is happening now. When we last time did this kind of like multi-stakeholder scenario workshop and published it, a huge work with like 120 stakeholder stakeholders involved, the next month uh, COVID broke out. Uh, so a quick, quick update was needed. The next time we did a lot uh, multi-stakeholder uh, strategic uh, foresight exercise, the next month we did have war in Europe. So we decided not to do this kind of foresight yeah, projects anymore. But it kind of like highlights that uh, foresight is about explaining and trying to build your resilience with foresight. So, um, but coming back to working with companies and, and foresight. So over the last two years, 
of course part because partly of these geopolitical shifts uh the interest towards foresight within companies has like increased a lot so uh there is uh, like no need to push uh foresight information anymore uh it has been much more challenging like 10 years ago when when i started working with companies uh like a, like a de decade ago uh we started working uh signal sessions and and doing horizon scanning with companies so we did have a large global network of uh, team finland members and uh, they spotted signals, weak signals in, in their locations around the world, and they published those in a platform. And then in Finland, we invited companies to discuss about these weak signals. And there was a process and there was like uh, like sense making with companies. And then we we kind of like assumed that, OK, now the action starts because the companies know that these weak signals we are spotting there is happening. So they get a competitive edge and they, they can start preparing their strategies. It was fairly successful for a while until it was not. It came out that these barriers like short-term business goals, short-term planning and that kind of issues kind of like a disturb the process. And also the process was quite heavy. So something needed to be done. So we broke the process so that we we are um, we now spot with this global network like uh, com concrete sales leads for companies so that they can take action right now. It's not about foresight. It's about like communicating with companies. Are you interested in this kind of like industry opportunities for short cycle? So that that kind of like responded more to the company's needs. But we uh, this uh, took uh, this foresight path separately so that we started to support companies own foresight capabilities uh, businesses they want to uh, have really like clear focus in their foresight exercises let's talk about like how does this energy transition affect your our business in two years in five years in 10 years do we have a vision of future they need to have a vision of future in order to put or invest in in you know how what kind of investments are required for technology uh, uh, transition situations so they need to plan ahead so that kind of uh, work we need to um, strengthen in companies own foresight capabilities and when i talk about foresight capabilities i mean all the dimensions building an organization in the company are uh, learning about the uh, 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 methods that fit to the goal, that fit to the actual uh, need. Because when, if we offer insights for companies, they are usually really, I mean, too general. They do not fit to the actual problem and they are not actionable. So building the bridge from the foresight to actionable insights, it's kind of like complicated. Uh, horizon scanning is not going to be enough. You need the translational steps and someone needs to facilitate, facilitate those steps. So that what if this happens in our industry, what actions do we need to take now? So, uh, so we kind of like try to provide concrete uh, toolkits for companies. And for that, we have been publishing uh, guidebooks and toolkits. They are freely available still today. The most recent one was uh, published last month. Also uh, in Finland, there operates this kind of like corporate foresight network. So they uh, benchmark each other's processes, methods, the ways of working. So we also try to facilitate that uh, network to be successful. So for companies, it's important to have uh, foresight as, a, as your exploration method. How do you see the opportunities arising for these disruptions? And it cannot be too gener on general level, but they need to have their own focus for that work. And any, any method they chose, it needs to have like an integration capacity to 
uh, decision making like directly. So it, it needs kind of like long term competence building. Also in Business Finland, we have transformed our own foresight to support our services so that our services are future proof and not, and not publishing so much of of these uh, scenarios and uh, uh, foresight reports, which which then tend to get old very soon. Maybe I stop here and we continue. Okay, thank you. So one thing that occurred to me is how do you package your foresight for companies of different sizes? Because those micro companies, they're, they're just dealing with sort of Absolutely. one or two people yeah. involved in something and then if yeah. you as you scale up bigger yeah. companies are able to devote more resources and interpret things in different ways very good question i think that the smes uh, are in that position but they don't have lots of resources to build up their own organizations for foresight so for them we kind of like direct our services and we can actually uh, uh, have foresight information to support them and invite them to clinics where they can learn this kind of like foresight techniques and tools. It doesn't require actually much to build your own like lighter foresight process, but for large companies, they do have advanced systems. They don't need our foresight uh, uh, support so much, but they are part of the networks that we offer. And they can they can teach others. Good. And mm -hmm. Alessandra, in terms of how the OECD assists governments on this, do you have a, a sort of best practice framework where you can uh, governments and government agencies and uh, policymakers can can tap into your best practice, or is does best practice even exist at this point? Yeah, so as I, as I said, we've developed this anticipatory governance framework and we're working on this strategic intelligence pillar. So the OECD has this convening power of experts uh, across the world. So Aaron is one of them, for example. Uh, and so we, we can tap the best minds to look at different methodologies used. So for us, the, the if you want the quality of the tools uh, uh, is very important. So. We need to have methodologies that are not opaque, that are transparent, that can be shared. And, and so by, by convening the best experts and then study uh, these methodologies as apply to individual technologies, I think we, we go uh, very far. And also we have a, a big cap internal capacity uh, for producing data uh, statistics. Uh, and again, uh, exploiting large databases so using text mining techniques and others uh, to provide the evidence for informed decisions. So that, that's all the OECD is about. And I think it can be used and it is used also for providing the strategic intelligence for policy making. Great, thank you. Uh, Aaron, how do you measure successful foresight? I love this question. Um, I think that the truthful answer is, are there violent reactions to the foresight the first time you present a draft? Do people get angry? Do they hate it? Do they scream a little bit? If they do, you've probably been really successful, right? Because you've pushed the, the, the system to really question its assumptions. And the trick to really good foresight work is how to achieve that sort of reaction without losing your job. Um, hard to do, of course, in, in practice. And, and I, but that, I think, is the ultimate measure. Everything else is uh, you know, kind of an output measure. You can think about number of workshops you do, number of people you've engaged with. I fully agree with Alessandra. You want to be talking to a range of different people, harnessing international networks. But ultimately, we need to have that kind of real strong pushback. The key Key to it is also then to calibrate, I guess, how that pushback happens, right? Do you do it in soft and gentle settings where you can do what Pierre Vaart called, uh, you know, a gentle reperceiving kind of process? Um, and if you do that, right, with, in a safe space where individuals have a container within which they can express their disagreement and violent reactions, then, then you know that the foresight has worked. So it's not just about the product it's about, or about an event, right? It's about that space that we're creating within which the, the deep uh, disagreements can, can take place. Okay, so let, let me get potentially a little controversial here. So as somebody who lived outside Ireland for most of my working life, when I came back, I found that culture about suggesting changes and uh, doing things differently was more like an Asian culture than a European culture. 
that there was this, we don't want to challenge consensus too much. I'm wondering from your experience uh, it, between Asia and Europe, and of course, there's very big differences across Europe and Asia, but do you see cultural issues around willingness to look to the future, this force, the whole foresight uh, matter? Another another really good question. Um, I think, you know, superficially there will there, there seem to be some cultural differences, right? A stronger sense of deference in in parts of, of Asia, more of a willingness um, to to push boundaries in parts of the Western world. But I actually think that a lot of this actually boils down not to culture, but to individual personality and risk appetite. In all cultures, there are going to be the ones for whom change will threaten the status quo. There will always be people who are uncomfortable with trying new things. There will always be people who find new ideas about the future slightly unpalatable. And that, I think, is at the core of all this work, right? When we push these boundaries, the violent reactions that I described happen if there are, if you are actually pushing people to get to ideas and, and, and issues that they might find unpalatable. And that happens in every culture. So the skilled futurist knows how to read not just the broad, generic, geographical culture of where they are, but the organization, right? What is the, bureauc the bureaucratic culture here? What is the sense of structure and hierarchy? And then figure out how they need to maneuver through that, right? Reading the ethnographics of power in that place, and then figuring out where exactly the stress points and points of challenge need to, to be. The tools become really important in that. The openness of the process, as Alessandra said, become really important. Bringing in the right credible people, whether it's from business or international networks, that also matters. But ultimately, you're curating experiences for your decision makers to, to do this work as best they can. Okay, good, good. Look, we'll start opening it up at the halfway point to, to questions. Uh, people who want to uh, ask a question, we'll go first to the floor. I'm just going to ask Larry a follow-up there, but if you could indicate, and we've got a microphone here, if you could say who you are uh, and put your question, uh, and we'll also take questions that are coming in thick and fast online. So, Larry, just to pick up on that issue there, how would you evaluate uh, Ireland's the, our, our culture here in terms of foresight? Um, well, I, I mean, I think it, certainly we, there's a lot of pieces of the, the, the kind of architecture that, there for us to have a quite a well-developed foresight system. I think, I mean, when you look at some of the things we're doing, like I was saying, I'm, I'm not sure, I, I think about it quite a bit as to what's, what's kind of missing. As I said, the tools are there, the, the issue about the wider system, but but also institutionally, whether something more is required. Um, I'm, I'm I sort of oscillate on that a little bit as to whether, because that tends to be sometimes as, as policy analysts, we think that the first solution to everything is some new institutional piece, and maybe that's not the case. But I think certainly thinking a little bit more formally about how we develop the structures and processes, but maybe just to pick, maybe if I could just pick up on your point about the group think, I mean, I think it's a, it's a thing that's often used here. And, and, as, and I, I do think, it, aside from foresight, we have quite a lot of structures where policy can be challenged. And there's, the, the issue maybe is that, do we need to develop them to have greater depth where we can really question the assumptions? I mean, I know you're doing a lot at the moment about our industrial policy where we're, right? like, do we have the space away from the people who are involved to, to really probe those assumptions? So I think we do have forums where, where, where contrary views can be aired, but maybe where we need to go a little bit further is how do we then take that, that sort of contrarian point and drill down deeper into it? And I think it was really interesting in the uh, colleagues from the OECD talked about 360 degree exploration of an issue. I think that's really interesting. Look at it from all angles. So I think maybe developing that deeper capacity is what we need. Good. Um, do I see any questions there? A gentleman at the front there. Thank you. A uh, very interesting and inspiring talk. I'm Nasir. I'm from uh, Sweden, working in a multinational company as a data scientist in AI lab. So uh, one of my questions is actually what I can, I found that there is a some kinds of underestimation in particular regions in Asia, Eurasia, whatever it is, in terms of manufacturing and technical leadership things from the European Union. Uh, so uh, what is, how do you see these kinds of things that in future patent landscape is not working current way, how, we, how it's been in the European Union? Uh, I mean, we cannot really protect our uh, patentability things because certain countries not really uh, respected them. And the second one is that also we are underestimating the progress uh, in China and also in particular the Russian region. So how do you put those things in your foresight, especially uh, manufacturing leaderships uh, in the European Union? Can I just clarify the second point? 
the second point was also like, uh, how are you seeing that uh, in, in terms of, so for, for example, in AI landscape, we definitely, we are not uh, leading in the European Union compared to China and also some of our partners. Uh, and, and that is happening probably of underestimating the progress. So in the foresight, uh, how are you challenging these things uh, in the European Union? Thank okay. You. Does anyone want to field that question, either of those two points? Is the European Union falling behind in a number of respects? Thanks, Magic Moment. Maybe someone else has a, oh, uh, other comments too, but uh, this, uh, I think that we have all been reading the Mario Draghi, this paper on European competitiveness. And I think that uh, uh, Foresight is quite heavily addressing to the facts that we are living in different kind of like scenarios. And we are currently uh, writing the scenarios where uh, Europe has a, dif a different position, positions and they, they not of all of them look really uh, uh, bright in terms of what you described, that we are falling behind in competition. But the, the question is that what needs to be done? How do you prepare for that kind of futures where actually we are, we need to be more, uh, be more investing in critical sectors. And now we are perhaps moving to the era of industrial uh, policies. So that's one scenario. Maybe someone else wants to, Point. I think that the forest side is actually addressing these competition issues. Anyone else before? Just another question that came in from Luke Carroll in terms of <clears throat> what's the right balance between generalists and specialists when you're you're doing doing foresight. Alessand Alessandra, would you that balance between specialists and and how do you get specialists and generalists to work together? Yeah. So. Again, we, we convene them, uh, so they, they are experts in their subject matters, they talk to each other, and it's our work. We are not specialists in foresight techniques ourselves, at least myself and my colleagues here, but we do this exercise of translating uh, um, and talking to policymakers and explaining uh, what these methodologies can do for them in terms of uh, supporting the policy. Uh, but I think it's it's less so difficult than what it seems because if uh, if you have some analysis that is grounded on data, then it's easier to communicate the results and convince them of where to go. Okay. And Aaron, do you want to come in? in quickly? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, it's one of my pet topics actually. I really love this question. Thank you, Luke, for asking it. Um, the short answer I would say is that some people should do foresight all the time and all people should do foresight some of the time within your organization. So you need, I do, I think some small specialist groups that are you know, developing the methods, learning the methodologies deeply and being able to apply this. The analogy would be the kind of foresight unit that Alessandra mentioned in the um, OECD. Uh, when I was in my last ministry in Singapore, we had a dedicated foresight team of one and a half people but they then tapped into a much broader group of kind of half timers or quarter timers who would come and dip in and out of the foresight system. And you need that as well, because you don't want to be doing foresight in a vacuum, right? You want to do it in a way that is relevant for policy users. So, so that sense of that intermediate group was important. And then everyone else became like policy consumers of foresight, where they would maybe have, once a month, there would be a meeting that focused on long-term issues where some of the products of the foresight team could be brought in. So I would think of it as a spectrum, really. And you want a team that has a whole range of, of these different um, user types. One other aspect, Quickly, just to touch on is that I think of in, in any good foresight team, you will want people who are content experts, right, who understand the issues that you're dealing with. You need people who are methods experts who can then bring in the, the, the knowledge of how to craft these safe uh, and, and constructive experiences to challenge assumptions and groupthink. And then a third group is you need to have people who know how to bring all of that and be relevant to the organization. And we must never underestimate the value of that third group of people. It's easy to focus on the first two, but if those groups are kind of running around on their own, willy-nilly not knowing how to make this work relevant to the foresight of the organization, then actually very often that work doesn't end up succeeding. Okay, and the uh, importance of leadership. Well, I, I, I echo what, exactly what you said, and said we did recent work on, say, agriculture, the just transition in agriculture, and we found that there's exactly the constellation you need to bring in. So you needed to engage with researchers in universities, you need to engage with 
um, sectoral experts. You needed to have farmers in the room, but you need to have people from local community development. So, and then it was the mix that brought out the, the sort of magic in a way, it was because it was that conversation that you could create. And just one additional point, that takes time to create that mix to really get those voices to come out. I mean, the first meeting you have, people just want to put their positions on the table. It took quite some time before you could really get somebody who was an expert doing research in UCD and somebody who's you know a small farmer to actually begin to hear each other. So I think you have to, take, to build those processes, but that's when the magic comes. But I absolutely agree it's that mix of expertise. Good, so we have a gentleman here. Thank you, uh, Donald Kavanagh from University College Dublin. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so just to pick up a point that Larry had made earlier about uh, Science Foundation Ireland coming out of uh, the technology foresight exercise back in the 90s. And Science Foundation Ireland was a really, really paradigm changing uh, event and it, it's been very important. But in some ways it's been so successful that uh, I think we've lost sight of perhaps other ways of doing things. It's, We've embedded a scientific way of looking at the world uh, right across. So we talk about evidence-based policy. We talk about stuff being grounded in data. So we have a very scientific approach to looking at the world. And science looks for evidence. But the future has no evidence. To, we have no evidence for the future, really. So I think we do. And it's a, it's a question, I suppose, of, of kind of left brain thinking dominating right brain thinking, which we get, we're taking the left brain to look at phenomena that are best looked at through the right brain. And the right brain really in Ireland, I think, is about storytelling. Like one of the issues with, with weak signals is that, that they will really be lost if they're going to be in a, in a, list, a list of bullet points and if they're in, a, in, a, in spreadsheets and whatever. But that's why storytelling, I think, is so important in telling good stories about the future. And we're not going to do that, I think, with, with the kind of evidence-based policy and approaches that we tend to privilege. Um, anyone want to respond to, to that? Well, yeah, I, please. Just, I mean, again, in the, in the, and, uh, in the Futures Ireland pro pro project that we did, I think what Donica said it became true, that we, we started in a very evidence-based program when we were doing scenarios. Actually, when it generated stuff was when we got the, we had, I, th I think it was, 160 people that we, as I said, deemed innovators. Part of the process, we asked them, tell, tell us the story of what they do. But the second story we asked them, tell us the story of what's your plan B. And, and every one of them had a kind of a plan B if things kind of went wrong. And those stories, I mean, they were really, really rich. Now, I don't know if we had the, at the time, did we analytically look at them enough? And I, I think if we went back and really, maybe you would have picked up some of but the story, but I'm not sure we had, the, we had the analytical capability ourselves to kind of understand, but it was very rich, I think, when you ask people to tell stories. Right. Um, you picked up on a point earlier on, uh, you used the word agility. Uh, it certainly strikes me that agility is, is really vital in, in all of this, given how things can happen that we just don't anticipate. And I'd like to, to come to you on, on, um, on how the war and uh, the change security environment in, in your long border uh, has, affected, uh, has affected you folks. Um, but that, that elaborate a bit more on that, on agility and the importance of agility. And maybe I'll come to, 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 to our speakers in, in, in Britain and France as well on that matter of agility. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think it's embedded in, in the term that you use about, you know, if you do a 360 exploration while you're throwing yourself open to different kind of parts of, of what might be going on. But I think it's very interesting to listen to the way you've explained the Finnish story, that it's, it, it starts with scans and then you go to try to make sense of it. And well, then you throw it into a network and see what they kind of think of it. Right at the core of that, then that's agility, you know, because that's what you're assuming has to happen. So they're, they're, none of those pillars give you the answer. And I suppose the question I was asking Dan is, I just don't know how well we're geared up in, in certainly in the, in, the, in the civil service system to, to actually respond to that kind of conversation because it's, it's, it's quite difficult. And by definition, it means you have to maybe, you know, you're dropping, you're changing things. And that's, that's not a critique of the civil service. It's just, it's a very difficult competency. It's what an entrepreneur does mm. in a sense, but it's hard for a large bureaucratic organization to run that way. So. Right, good. Uh, Alessandra, Aaron, any? I just wanted to react on this issue of storytelling, which is really important one. Uh, but again, 
uh, it's not the, the only thing. So the, I still believe the evidence, the quantitative evidence and, and strong evidence is important. Basically, we don't know what we don't know, right? But we generate a lot of knowledge and all these different communities, all these different techniques and tools generate knowledge that might be slightly different. Uh, but we need to make sense of all of these. So the only way of making sense is to get together and see how we define things, uh, how we can have methodologies that are strong and transparent. And then we work out all these different knowledge, including storytelling that comes from the knowledge, uh, more qualitative stuff. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Yeah, thanks. I, I first of all, I would completely echo what Alessandra just said about methodological pluralism, right? That you need the ethnography, the storytelling, and the hard data and the an analytics. Either of them by themselves is like fighting with one hand behind your back, right? The future is complex enough. We need every possible tool um, out there. And I think this is where that point connects to your point about agility, because I think the, the enemy of good foresight is, the, is, is not being agile, right? It's being rigid in either your process or your content. And I wanted to respond here to Doug Robinson's question uh, that's also in the chat. Hi, Doug, it's good to uh, hear from you again. Uh, and and I, your question was about what examples of bad foresight and what the negative consequences can be, right? I think one example of bad foresight is actually when we are overly rigid about the process, right? Where we kind of say, oh, all we care about is getting through these particular steps, getting data in a way that is a tick box kind of method, whether that's qualitative or quantitative data, right? You say, I want to talk to challenging people, and then you meet 10 of them because they all have different email addresses from you, and you assume that that's diversity, but maybe you selected them in ways that are not that diverse, right? And when we do that, we can end up with really bad outcomes because you will hear what you want to hear and then end up with a set of scenarios that actually don't question assumptions at all. You know, I don't think it's a coincidence, for instance, that sometimes we do these big scenario processes and then something comes along and we realize, oh, we didn't, we didn't account for those big changes at all, right? Whether that's the election of President Trump or Brexit or a pandemic or a war. Um, I've done scenario exercises where we assume that countries, you know, in the world would remain broadly the same. And then the, the, as we're presenting the driving forces of those scenarios, we find actually those assumptions were wrong because we didn't question them enough, precisely because we didn't get out of the, you know, the ambit of, of the, the rigidity of our, our process. But there's also the possibility of being overly rigid in the content, I think, you know, where, where you, you kind of focus so much on footnoting the content and writing up a, a piece of research that you forget that the point of that research is actually to push your organizational boundaries and help decision makers to do better work and to understand the world better. So I've seen examples again, you know, where that overemphasis on, on scenarios as research, but not scenarios as a tool of reperception and, and assumption questioning ends up with, with, with situations where leadership feels like, you know, they've just had their assumptions validated. But then a few months later, the world comes and, and surprises them quite fundamentally. So I think we want to avoid that sort of rigidity because it can be, be very quite, be quite dangerous. Can I quickly just answer Doug's question on successful uh, use of scenarios as well? So um, you asked so about Aaron, just, you know, just let, well. Aaron, okay. just let me introduce uh, Douglas okay. Robinson is also from the OECD uh, who's put this question. Yes. Just let me clarify that. Go ahead, Aaron. Perfect. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so you asked for some examples, Doug. Um, I, I think there's a few. Uh, one of my favorite ones is actually how Shell used their uh, scenarios um, around the time when Gorbachev was still in power in, uh, back then, the USSR, right? Um, and they didn't, actually, no, this was pre-Gorbachev, sorry. Uh, and they didn't name him, but they did say that in a scenario where a charismatic leader appears in the Soviet Union who will change their you know, fundamental economic and political assumptions, that could lead to very fundamental consequences for the, like back then, right, the energy industry and, and global petrochemicals. So without naming a specific name, they, I think, identify what a particular architect could do in terms of the transformative potential for world order. Uh, that's one example which I think le then led them to think about preparing for a very different world in terms of European configurations of power and also then a global world order that wasn't bipolar in the sense of, you know, US versus USSR. Uh, and a much more micro scale, in, in a lot of times in Singapore, when we've done scenarios, the first time we did them, we found that a lot of our decision makers were so focused on geopolitical and geoeconomic concerns, but not a lot of them were thinking about internal social concerns, right? Issues around social cohesion, trust between the state and individual citizens, 
communal cohesion uh, between the different races that uh, exist in Singapore. And, and because of that, because of the gap that we identified, the scenarios were structured in a way to draw attention to the social consequences. And that actually led to some quite fundamental um, re-perceptions of, of the way policy got made in the social sphere. New agencies got set up. You know, we can talk about the details separately if anyone wants to reach out. Uh, but there were new agencies set up. There was new emphasis brought into the coordination processes uh, amidst uh, social sector agencies. And that allowed us to kind of redress what was clearly an, an imbalance right, in the overall approaches. Um, an imbalance that was not there out of malice or even neglect. It was just natural human nature that people were focused on, on more external issues than they were on the, the internal. So two examples there from, from very different parts of the world on, on how scenarios can help us do reperception in a, in a positive way. Let me, Tom Ferris, a, a member of the Institute, makes more a point. Uh, he wants to highlight um, um, an OECD, another OECD report that was published uh, with the Irish authorities in May 2023 entitled Strengthening Policy Development. Um, it was an excellent report, actually, so let me just bring that to, to people's attention if they didn't see it last year. Thanks for reminding us of that. Um, Tom, any other questions? Uh, Barry, my colleague at the front here. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, panel. My name is Barry Colfer. I'm the Director of Research here. Uh, I have two questions, Dan, if I may, and through the chair, I might put the first short one to, to Soila and to, um, yeah, let's just stick with Soila. It's about AI and it's about something we've discussed briefly. Um, how can artificial intelligence best be used to support strategic foresight? I know Business Finland uh, makes good use of it. For, uh, perhaps, Larry, you might have something to say about that as well from the coalface. The, the second question, Dan, I might put to Aaron and Alessandro online, and it's about outcomes. And so given the fourth side is about considering possible futures, um, some of which may be true or indeed none of them may become true, how do you actually measure success or effectiveness? Are you just looking at methodological robustness? Are you looking at impact on policy decisions? Or is there any other way of knowing whether your horizon scanning slash four slide is, is done well or not. Thanks. So, yeah. Thank you, Barry. Uh, well, the question was about using AI in foresight, and that's a really interesting question. But first, uh, one uh, maybe a notion about the using tools. Uh, tools are not the solution, and I agree with the previous uh, speakers that uh, uh, it's important not to get locked in to process or not to get locked into tools because they are only your your uh, your your support. But uh, AI can be used in multiple uh, ways. In, for instance, in scenario work, uh, you can define scenario questions with AI. Well, I can now use well chat uh, GPT four, or you can use Copilot uh, if you have good data in house and that's more secure. So, uh, for instance, no, instead of uh, asking scenarios of what are the what what are the four scenarios of Finnish competitiveness, you can ask like uh, define the the uh, the prompt so that you are asking that what do we know about this situation and what we don't know, what are the key uncertainties? How do you define the most critical questions? Uh, regarding, for instance, our capabilities in dual use technologies or something, so that you can find the focus for the scenarios, so that the scenarios can be good to like like Aaron was pointing out here. It's the the excellent tool for thinking, but you need to have the 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 proper uh, question so that you have the dimensions that really answers and gives you like different scenarios so that you can prepare for the mm -hmm. scenario. So. AI can be used for defining the questions for scenarios. Also, um, AI can be actually used to uh, spot signals. So I have one company that they are having a Teams channel to collect signals around their sales network around the world. So it creates like hundreds of, of uh, insights, weak signals or trends. But then you need to have like a tools just to cluster them and ask questions of those. So you don't actually need to have a, like an expensive tool to make horizon scanning, organize horizon scanning in your organization. You can use like a Teams channel and co-pilot. And I mean, uh, the, the opportunities are like huge. These were just two examples how we are at the moment using. 
basically answered the second question already. Maybe Alessandra, if, if you have any thoughts on, on measuring success. Yes, so uh, indeed, uh, I would uh, repeat, for me, it's essential to have quality of these methodologies. Uh, uh, so, and, and so we need to have benchmarks because they could produce plausible results, but we don't know if we don't have a measure of quality of how these things have been done and how uh, some of those could be opaque. But uh, apart from the quality, I guess one measure of success is exactly that there is no one outcome, but we can produce a set of, uh, of um, outcome and possibility and options. And all these options can be then assessed somehow, and they can be implemented in different contexts. So it's already a success to be able to produce different options that then policymakers can take and implement in their own context. Okay, thank you. So let, let me just sort of come to a question about how Finland is, is preparing for a very changed or is is, is doing things in, in terms of a very changed security environment. But also just make three observations about uh, the war in Ukraine. So even a couple of weeks beforehand, almost nobody predicted that Russia would attempt to invade and overthrow the government and take over the entire country. Then nobody expected Russia to res Ukraine to resist to the extent they have. And then nobody expected the Russian economy to shake off the effects of the war and the tightest set of sanctions that have ever been introduced. So all of these things have come about that nobody sort of expected and how this, this played out. So I just maybe that's worth making a point and different things that were completely unexpected all happened one after the other. But in terms of you're on the front line, you have a massive border with Russia. You almost again, without nobody predicted that you would join NATO after having never, never joined. Um, how is... How are businesses in, in Finland preparing? Do they have backup plans in case of more aggressive, whether it's hybrid warfare or whether it's worse than that? Um, do they have do they have backup locations in other countries? What sort of contingency plans are they do they make for uh, things getting worse and it affecting Finland? Uh, yeah, that's a critical question for for uh, Finnish resilience, of course. Uh, Unfortunately, the businesses are kind of like on reactive mood when it comes to the investment decisions they have made like years ago. Maybe a parallel example is that um, I remember it was more than five years ago, maybe seven years ago, we published a report on the um, risks of investing heavily in certain uh, geographical areas and just uh, a notion that balancing risks might be unnecessary and decentralizing the supply networks. I don't think that it had any uh, impact uh, because of the, well, like mentioned, the, uh, the business goals are usually quite short term and also uh, the investments are quite heavy when you uh, approach to new markets so you have made the investment so this kind of like information push is not really impactful in that point so but how businesses are coping in this situation of course they need need uh, information uh, and we are currently we are preparing um, like scenarios to how to find opportunities and balance in, in this uh, shifting market situation. This creates opportunity, opportunities for certain sectors. In each scenarios, there are always some of the business sectors that benefit of this situation. So I, I think the foresight can be used, scenario thinking can be used in this situation too, but unfortunately, I don't know. I don't think that businesses do have uh, enough resilience in this situation at the moment. Closing remarks. I don't see further questions there from the audience. Uh, if anybody, Larry, you want to come in, and our speakers, Aaron and Alessandra, if you have any closing remarks that you'd uh, like to share, um, you, you might prepare those while Larry gives his final thoughts. Um, just, just come back on one or two points. On, so on the AI piece that um, Barry asked about, I, I, I think as well as, the, the, if you like, the, the use of AI in futures, the other part of that is the impact of AI and, and what we're, we're doing to think about that. 
And I think it is a very particular challenge for foresight to think about AI because, I mean, AI is, is this, you know, emergent technology that impacts on so many of, 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 you know, applications in all of our lives. And often AI technology that's developed, it's in the hands of users, it becomes different things. So I think it, it's a really profound problem or challenge or opportunity, if you like, how we're going to engage with the way AI is going to shape our society, economy, society and environment. And I think it's, it's, it's really exciting in one, one sense because also we have so much in, in, in intelligence already in the co country. Um, at a, a recent event, I heard somebody speak from the Science Foundation Ireland Insights Group. And I mean, they just talked about the number of PIs we have that are working on different aspects of technology. And I think we really need to look at all of the ways we can harness that to sort of for, for, to, to maximize uh, opportunities in, in the country. And, and maybe just two, two well, one other point just to make um, on, on the point that Tom Ferris made about policymaking and that, that document. I think what's really important in that document is that it is the focus of it is to try to get policymaking in Ireland to focus on three things. So we already, as, as Tonica said, and maybe we do too much, we're, we really are, are aware of the evidence-based piece. But the, set, the other two pillars in that is that policymaking needs to be much more attuned to feasibility right from the start. And the third piece is that it needs to be fo focused on legitimacy right from the start. What will citizens what will see as being legitimate uh, uh, policy in a particular area. I think the reason that's important is it's trying to get us in Ireland beyond this sort of critique that's often used is that this that we are very good at doing policy, not so good at implementing. Well, one way to bridge that is when you start doing policy, engage with people who will be implementing from the start. So I think that's an important kind of development in in, in the Irish policy making system, and obviously it connects with with foresight. So, great, thank you, uh, Alessandra. Uh, any closing thoughts? Well, I guess in the world we are living in, uh, anticipation is is key. There is no way out. Uh, so I think there it's important to be able to connect strategic intelligence to policy better. Strategic intelligence or foresight or they sometimes they sit outside the policy making, but um, sometimes they they don't, and so that's where we have more successful examples. So anticipation rests on a lot of tools and they need to be sound robust and transparent so let's work together on that thank you um and aaron final word to you thank you thanks um i thought i'd just share one observation that peter schwartz who was formerly with shell and the global business network now with salesforce once shared with me when i was first embarking on futures as a journey and he did say that futures we have to think of it as a campaign right a long drawn protracted process not just a single report not just a single event uh, but many events all accumulating and i mentioned this because of a few things one is campaigns are intrinsically human right they are they're not processes that can be completely broken down into scientifically engineering engineered pieces we have to account for the fact that they'll be unpredictable, they'll be subjective, and they'll bring particular realities into that process. This is important in response to the AI question, because I think we, we need to always remember that we can't really remove the human, right? We can complement the human with technology, but we'll never be able to remove the human from the loop in this process. And I'm kind of bearing my colors completely here. I, I don't think AI will replace us. I think it will augment us at best. Uh, so that, that's one, one aspect of this. The second is that you know, there was a question from Brian about how productive uh, such processes can be or unproductive. And I think the very language of productivity and unproductivity um, isn't quite the right one to use when it comes to foresight, because it assumes that there's a point at which you can optimize. What we should be thinking about is are the processes as fruitful and meaningful as possible. And so a good process might have little micro failures at the start or in the middle, but they will be responded to, they will be agile and evolve the, the overall process. And if a decision maker is disagreeing with early parts of a scenario process, we can find ways to bring them on board because it's a campaign, right? Because we bring them on board by addressing their views early on in ways that are evolutionary and, and adaptive. So I think the more we think about futures as this kind of evolutionary human process, the stronger our, our work can actually become because it allows us to not just optimize at single points, but think of this continuous journey that we, we might be on. And I wish everyone well on the journeys that they will be embarking on um, in future. Thank you. Thank you. Good. So unless there are any final questions, I'm going to thank our panelists for a very 
uh, thought-provoking and detailed discussion. Uh, so thank you all very much. And thank everyone for coming who's here in person and everyone who uh, attended online and contributed. Thanks very much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.